In this video, we're going to go through ATP, so adenosine triphosphate. We're going to look at the structure of ATP. We're going to look at how ATP is synthesized, how it is hydrolyzed into ADP and PI. And we're also going to look at some of the useful properties of ATP that make it a really good energy donor or energy carrier. So let's get started. Let's look at the structure first. So ATP is a phosphorylated nucleotide. It's formed from ribose, a molecule of adenine and three phosphate groups. So these are the three phosphate groups. This is our ribose sugar, which remember is a five carbon sugar. So we can also refer to it as a pentose sugar, but we should be able to name it. It's ribose sugar. So it's the same sugar that we find in an RNA nucleotide. This is adenine, which is obviously a nitrogenous base, and it's the same nitrogenous base that we can find in DNA and RNA, but with ATP, it is always adenine. There's no other option, okay? So that's the general structure. Now, you don't have to draw this in detail. You simply have to draw the shapes like I've done here. So we use three circles to represent the phosphate groups. We use the pentagon to represent the ribose sugar, and we tend to use a rectangular shape for the adenine. The base okay so you should be able to draw that if we think about the differences between an atp molecule and say um, an rna nucleotide that can come up quite a lot because there are similarities but there are also differences so let's just draw the molecule of atp again so this is how you will draw your atp this is obviously how you draw your RNA nucleotide, okay? So what are the similarities and what are the differences? In terms of similarities, they both contain ribose sugar. So they both have the same pentose sugar. They both contain phosphate or phosphate groups, and they both contain a nitrogenous base but we have to be clear on what the differences are because this is probably what they're going to ask you if this comes up on the exam so in terms of differences ATP has three phosphate groups and obviously an RNA nucleotide which is the monomer of RNA, has just one phosphate group, okay? And then the other difference, ATP has adenine, so the base is always adenine, whereas RNA can have adenine, or think about the other bases that can be found in RNA. It could be uracil, it could be cytosine, or it could be guanine. OK, now I suppose they could also ask you for the differences between a molecule of ATP and a DNA nucleotide. Now, if they ask you that question, again, a DNA nucleotide only has one phosphate group. A DNA nucleotide has deoxyribose sugar, whereas ATP has ribose sugar. So the sugar would also be different there. And with DNA, if it's a DNA nucleotide, the bases can be adenine thymine guanine or cytosine, whereas as we've said, ATP is always adenine. Okay, so look out for those questions because they're quite straightforward. They're quite nice questions as long as you know the structure of these molecules. Let's move on and think about how we can make or synthesize ATP and how we can break it down or hydrolyze ATP. Now you'll notice that these ATP uh, molecules here have been drawn the opposite way around. Now this is because for AQA, AQA don't really mind which way you draw your ATP molecule. So here we've got the ribose sugar, we've got the base which is adenine on this side, and we've got the three phosphate groups on this side. So it's kind of like a mirror image of what I had on the screen earlier. Now, AQA don't mind which way you draw it because they've actually drawn it this way around in their notes and on the specification. 
But just to warn you, if you are taking OCR biology, I'm going to flip back. If you are doing OCR biology, you have to draw it like this, okay? So you have to have the three phosphate groups on the left. They have to be attached to the ribose sugar by a vertical line, that bond. And then the adenine has to be on the right, and that should not be attached by a vertical line. It should be a horizontal line, really, okay? So OCR are really particular about how you draw your ATP, and this is correct. So I would recommend we all draw it like this. But AQA don't mind if you flip it. They don't really mind about your bond angles. So you could be drawing it like this if you're studying AQA. Okay, so what we've got here is we've got ATP at the top, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, because obviously it has three phosphate groups. When we hydrolyze it, if we label the diagram at the bottom, We've obviously still got our adenine, we've still got our ribose sugar. We've now only got two phosphate groups because we've hydrolyzed this bond here. So we've removed that last phosphate group, which gives us what we call an inorganic phosphate because it's no longer associated with carbon. It's an inorganic phosphate which we can represent with a capital P and a lowercase i. Now, this would be called ADP. And as we've said, this would be an inorganic phosphate. Now, ADP stands for adenosine diphosphate, which makes total sense because ADP has two phosphates because we've hydrolyzed that last bond and we've released that inorganic phosphate. So ATP, when hydrolyzed, will give us ADP plus PI. Now let's label the arrows in the center. So going in this direction, this would be hydrolysis because we're hydrolyzing that bond. And this requires an enzyme called ATP hydrolase, which is sometimes shortened to ATPase but I always call it ATP hydrolase because that helps me to remember that it's hydrolyzing that bond. It's hydrolyzing ATP to give us AT ADP and PI. Now, when this happens, it's going to release energy. When that bond gets broken, it's releasing energy. And that's the whole point of ATP. We make ATP in respiration, and then we can hydrolyze ATP to release energy and provide energy for all of the reactions, such as active transport or protein synthesis, that require energy within the cell. This is reversible though, right? So once we've hydrolyzed the ATP into ADP and PI and released energy, we can use the ADP and PI to reform or synthesize ATP, which is what we do in respiration. And plants can also make ATP in photosynthesis. So let's look at the reversible reaction. So going back up from ADP and PI back to ATP, this would be condensation because we are now making a bond. And this would be done by the enzyme ATP synthase, okay? And this is making a bond, so this requires energy, which we can get from glucose in respiration, or plants can use light energy to make ATP. So this reaction requires energy, because we're making that bond, whereas this reaction releases energy. Let's look at this in a simpler way. So let's do some simple chemical equations showing how we can synthesize and how we can hydrolyze ATP. In the simplest form, if we're going to hydrolyze ATP, we'd show our ATP or adenosine triphosphate. We're going to do the hydrolysis of it. So that would produce ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate. If we're gonna make or synthesize ATP, we take ADP and PI, and we join them together in a condensation reaction to make ATP. Now, this is the simplest 
uh, equation and it'd probably just be worth one mark if you're asked to give the simple equation. You could show the water though, couldn't you? Because if we're going to hydrolyze ATP, hydrolysis does require the addition of water. So to hydrolyze ATP, we could put the water in there, um, which is going to hydrolyze that bond and break it down into ADP and PI. If we're going to make ATP, obviously we're going to make a bond, so this is a condensation reaction, that would remove water. So we'd also see water formed as one of the products. So we could put water over there. Now, quite often in the exam, you don't need to show the water. It just asks you for the simple equation. So you can literally just do ATP hydrolyzes into ADP and PI or ADP and PI makes ATP in condensation. The last thing we're going to do is consider some of the advantages of ATP. So why do we use ATP to release energy? One of the things we can say is it's an instant or it's an immediate source of energy. So it's a quick release of energy because only one bond needs to be broken. So we just have to hydrolyze one bond and you get an instant or immediate release of energy. It's a simple reaction. It also releases small, suitable or manageable amounts of energy. Now, you might think that doesn't sound like an advantage, but it is because it's far less wasteful. You're going to lose less energy as heat. OK, and it's going to make sure that you can hydrolyze just enough ATP to get the right amount of energy that the reaction needs without being wasteful or potentially losing lots of energy as heat from the cell. So the fact that it releases a small or a suitable amount of energy every time we hydrolyze ATP is an advantage of using ATP. It's a universal energy carrier, so all cells can use it and it can be used for many processes. So for example, it can be used for active transport, which we know requires energy. It can be used for protein synthesis, or to be honest, the synthesis of any biological molecule is gonna require energy. So synthesizing glycogen would be another good example to give. Muscle contraction is another really good example to give because that requires loads of energy from ATP. Number four, it's really quick to synthesize or to make ATP. As we've seen with our equations, ADP plus PI makes ATP. And cells can make that really easily. Equally, it's really quick to hydrolyze it or break it down. So ATP is quickly hydrolyzed into ADP and PI. And that's when it releases energy. Finally, and this is one thing that you might not fully understand in year 12, but you will when you're in year 13, the phosphate can be used to phosphorylate other molecules. So when we hydrolyze ATP into ADP and PI, this is our inorganic phosphate. And this inorganic phosphate can be used to phosphorylate other substances. Now, this literally just means we're going to add the phosphate group to another substance. So one of the examples that you'll see is right at the start of respiration, we actually hydrolyze ATP and use the inorganic phosphate to phosphorylate the glucose. That's like the first stage of respiration, both aerobic and anaerobic. It requires ATP, which we hydrolyze. We then use that phosphate group to phosphorylate glucose. Why? Because when you phosphorylate something, it makes it more reactive. Or it makes it unstable. So it will start to break down. And that's what we see in respiration. When we phosphorylate the glucose, it becomes very reactive and unstable and it will break down 
Um, and that's in the first stage, which is called glycolysis. We're not going to get into that in this video because this is obviously aimed at year 12. But in year 12, you should be able to appreciate that one of the advantages of ATP is being able to use that phosphate group to phosphorylate other substances and make them more reactive. We're going to leave it there for today. I hope you found this little explainer video useful. Let me know in the comments if you have and be sure to check out all of my other videos and keep coming back each week because we're going to keep posting to help you with year 12 and revision if you're in year 13.